you'd open your Bibles to Psalm 19. I was speaking with someone yesterday, and they said, now, uh, what are you doing these days? Are you hopping around? I said, I'm not hopping around. I'm plodding through Psalm 19. And what a, what a blessing it is to go through Psalm 19. And I also shared with them uh, how much uh, this is the beginning of my 20th year uh, in the ministry. And I remember, and I told this person yesterday, I said, when I started out, I would be from the organ to the piano. And, uh, and just, I mean, I'm, I remember, I think, when Bonnie first saw me preach years back, uh, I used to jump up and down, yell, pound, run back and forth. But now that I'm older, I basically am pretty sedate, and I stay right here. And so uh, uh, if, if the clock rolls back, I'll run back and forth and, and stuff like that. But I don't do much of that anymore. But I still am as excited as I was when I was a little fella about the Word of God. Psalm 19 is our introduction to God. God has chosen to introduce himself to humanity in two very special ways. In Psalm 19, I'll read the first six verses. It describes for us the general revelation that's through nature and the special revelation that's through the scriptures that God has revealed himself to us. It says the heavens, Psalm 19.1, are telling of the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone throughout the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course." Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other ends of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The question you need to answer this morning is, have you ever met your creator? Have you personally met your creator? The scriptures begin, and and the book of Genesis opens with God introducing himself. And it says, in the beginning, if you have any doubts, if you want to know where everything came from, if you want to know your origin, and if you know your origin, you will know your purpose, and if you know your origin and purpose, you'll find your destiny. But if you want to know where you came from, God says, let me introduce myself. In the beginning, God actively oversaw and actually from nothing created all things into something. And the scriptures say, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which appear were not made of things which do appear. They were made from nothing, and God called them into existence. That's how the scriptures open. The Gospels, and, and in the Gospels, the prologue, and if you ever look at a harmony of the Gospels, the very first word of the Gospels come from the Gospel of John, where Jesus Christ is introduced before he's born because, of course, he has eternally existed. And the Gospels begin with saying this, In the beginning was the Word, all things were made by the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so the Creator from Genesis, this is, I want to introduce myself to you, in the Gospel says, I've actually come to earth. I'm here. I have come, I have walked, I have lived among you, and now I have left my body, the church, to tell you and point you to your creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures end. In fact, I'll read to you from the book of the Revelation. In fact, the last words from God about human history conclude with the creator returning to the earth. Remember, he made it. Then he invaded it as a baby, lived, ministered, and was murdered by mankind as mankind murdered their maker on the cross. But he's going to come back. Because he was buried and rose on the third day and ascended back and sat down because his work was done. But someday he's going to stand up and he's going to mount a horse. and He's going to ride back here on a white horse. He's going to be wearing white robes that are dipped in blood. And it's going to say that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And history will conclude as Christ, the creator, comes to earth to take his place as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen to the book of Revelation. It says... He that liveth forever and ever, who created the heavens, the things that are therein, the earth, the things that are on the earth, the sea, and the things which are in the sea, declares that time shall be no more. See, the Bible begins with the Creator introducing himself. 
The Gospels begin with the Creator identifying Himself as none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Time ends for human history when the Creator Himself comes back to take back His creation. Have you met your Creator? The Scriptures say that meeting will begin when you start to listen to His voice. First, you listen to his voice in the general revelation. You see the order and the symmetry. You see the incredible complexity. You see the fact that no matter where scientists probe, they find order. They find laws governing. They find no chaos. They find nothing but the signs of intricate design that point to a creator. But the scriptures say that you can't really know him merely by listening to his voice in creation because he's written a book. And that book is the book that you hold in your hands that we just have to say, God, open my eyes. I want to see Jesus in this book. For me, it was 34 years ago, during what some of you might be old enough to remember was the Cuban Missile Crisis, when it finally dawned on my little mind that when we were getting under those desks at school doing the, remember the atomic bomb drills, you know? Uh, maybe here you did tornado ones. We were getting ready for the atomic bomb, and we used to crawl under our desk. And at six years old, I finally watched enough footage of those, uh, you know, the, the uh, hydrogen bombs out there in the center of the Pacific, you know, that great big mushroom cloud, and then the, uh, the atomic bombs out at White Sands, you know, where they were blowing up. And I looked one day at that picture, and then I looked at my desk. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I don't think I'll make it under the desk. <laughs> and I was six years old, and I came home to my mom, and I said, you know, Mom, Every night at Bible story time, you always mention that, that you and Dad and my sisters were going to heaven, and I wasn't. Well, I want to go now, because my desk isn't going to cut it with these atomic bombs. And I remember at six years old, my mom didn't, didn't do any less than open the Bible to me. And I remember, I can still remember her old, worn-out Bible, and she opened it up to the Gospels and introduced me to the Lord Jesus Christ. For Bonnie, it was when she was 21 years old. The same thing the Word of God. And you come to know Christ as He opens our eyes to His book. And when we look in that book, we can find Him. Someone wrote these words, I find my Lord in the book wherever I chance to look. He's the theme of the Bible. He's the center and heart of the book. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the lily, bright and fair. Wherever I open the Bible, the Lord of the book is there. He's at the book's beginning when He gave the earth its form. He's the ark of shelter bearing the brunt of the storm. He's the burning bush of the desert and the budding of Aaron's rod. Wherever I look in the Bible, I can see the Son of God. He's the ram upon Moriah. He's the ladder from earth to sky. He's the scarlet cord in the window. He's the serpent lifted high. He was the smitten rock in the desert. He's my shepherd with staff and crook. The face of my Lord I'll discover wherever I open this book. He's the seed of the woman, the savior of virgin born. He's the son of David whom men rejected with their scorn. His garments of grace and beauty and stately as our priest forever, our Melchizedek, I find my Lord. As the light of eternal glory whom John the apostle saw, the light of the golden city, the lamb without spot or flaw, the bridegroom coming at midnight for whom the virgins look. Wherever I open my Bible, I find the Lord of the book. Have you met the Lord of the book? He's the creator. He introduced himself in Genesis. He's the savior who, as creator, invaded this earth as a babe and died when mankind murdered him. But he rose and he's returning as judge. But only those who meet him as their creator and redeemer will stand in the judgment. Those who have never met him will wither and be cast into the furnace of fire. Let's look in Psalm 19 as I want to delineate this just briefly this morning. Because we've already learned that general revelation a few weeks back is nature as it reveals and magnifies the wondrous character of our almighty God. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 1 and verse 19 that that which may be known of God is manifest in creation. For God hath showed it to them because the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen because they're understood by the things which are. Even his eternal power, verse 20 of Romans 1 says, so that they are without excuse. Remember, people...
come into the world holding two little candles. The candles are their conscience that God built into them. And then the other candle is creation. And if you'll hold your candle up to creation, you'll see the general revelation of God. You'll see his hand, the fingerprint of God everywhere. And if you hold up your other candle of conscience, you'll find, because we were made in the image of God, that there is within us an awareness of right and wrong. And if we will say, God, I know you're out there, and in my heart I know I've wronged you, I want to seek after you. The Bible says if you'll seek after him, you'll find him. Because God is the one that's, that's lighting every man that cometh into the world and every woman and every child. But next, we need to see that our creator reveals his name. And this is what's so interesting because, you know, people act as if there's, there's two different gods here. That there's this kind of unknown bad guy in the Old Testament that's just killing those Canaanites and burning up Sodom and Gomorrah. And then we've got Jesus, you know. You know, we can relate to him, but not that guy, this mean one. But, you know, the one in the Old Testament is the one in the New Testament. There's only one God. And God, the Son, is the one who created the earth in the beginning. And the Scriptures tell us this, that in Psalm 19 it says, the heavens, look at that, are declaring or telling the glory of God. What are they telling? Well, the Scriptures say this, Hebrews 1.3, Jesus is the brightness of of God's glory. Jesus is the express image of God's person. Jesus uphold, upholds all things by the word of his power, and Jesus purged our sins, and when he finished, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father on high. Who's the creator? Well, the heavens are saying they're showing the glory of God, but Jesus steps forward and says, I want to introduce myself. I'm the creator. That's why there is no salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven, ever given on this planet, whereby we must be saved other than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the door of salvation. He is the door of the sheepfold. He is the way, the truth, the life. He's the only one. And the scriptures say the heavens are declaring that. Colossians 1.15 links the creator with the gospel of creation. And it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15 for by him, verse 16, all things were created. And verse 20 says, he's the one that made peace through his cross. Have you ever met your creator? The evidence is you have peace in your heart with God. You know, we get peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that happens, we start having the peace of God invading our lives. Well, we next need to see that our creator reveals what his creatures need. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 of Psalm 19 says this. It says, their line has gone throughout all the earth. What does that teach us this morning? What is that talking about? Well, the Apostle Paul in Romans 10, 18 quotes it. He says this, but I say, have they not heard? Verily their sound went out into all the earth, yea, their words to the ends of the world. The Apostle Paul says that the general revelation of God has permeated through every culture. Anthropologists that study ancient civilizations tell us that there is a similarity in all the legends. They all go back and hearken back to the same thing. In fact, every major civilization on this planet goes back to Noah and the flood. And even the Chinese symbol is a little boat with eight little marks in it for eight little people that were in the boat. And that's, that's the symbol that goes back that reminds of judgment and God judged the whole earth. Every culture harkens back to God. His line has gone throughout the whole earth. Jesus said in John 1, 9, that I am the true light. I have lighted everyone that comes into the world. Remember, people don't die and go to hell because they don't hear about Jesus. They die and go to hell because of their sin. Everyone, everyone has had the light of the world appear to them. You say, wait a minute. You mean those people with those big plates in their lips, you know, that, that have... You know, all the painted faces and, you know, spears, they've heard about Christ. They, in their heart, have had an opportunity to respond to their creator. And if they will respond to their creator, as Acts 17 says, if they will seek after the one that is knocking at their heart's door, God will bring them the gospel. You say, are you sure? Yes. There were obviously a group of people in ancient Nineveh. That was the capital of Assyria. That's up where the Kurdish deal is going on right now. You know, all the no-fly and shooting the missiles and Iraq and Iran over there. Did you know there was someone over there in that city of Nineveh 800 years before Christ? And somebody over there must have looked up 
and seen the God of the universe in his creation and said, God, I want to know more about you. You know what God did? He took a man in a, in a boat sailing to Gibraltar. That's southern Spain. This fellow was on his way across the Mediterranean Sea, and God says, I'm going to get him, and he sent a storm. And, and this man got thrown overboard by the sailors, and as he was sinking down into the water, a gigantic sea creature swallowed him, and in all of his digestive juices, that sea creature held this man, and this man was entombed in the seaweed in the center of that fish, and that fish took him all the way across the Mediterranean and vomited him out, the scriptures say, on the shore, and all bleached white, he walked to Nineveh. Now, i tell you what, you better do what God wants you to do. Or next time you're out in Ten Killer Lake, some fish might get you <laughs> and take you right back to Union High School and spit you out on the lawn and say, why don't you talk for me? Or wherever God wants to use you. You see, someone in Nineveh needed to hear the gospel. And Jonah, Jonah and the whale, it doesn't say whale in the Bible, it says sea monster. Same word that's used for dinosaur in the Bible. But, but God wanted those people in Nineveh to know. And here are these pagans that had never heard of the true and living God. This prophet walks for three and a half days through town and preaches, and the entire city turns to the true and living God. You see, it doesn't matter where you are on this planet. God will get the word to you. I had the opportunity of staying in the home of Dr. Francis Schaefer years back before he died. And I remember at supper every night when we'd come down, supper went from 6 o'clock to 11 o'clock every night, whether you wanted to or not. It was five hours long. And you'd sit at this long table, and Francis Schaefer would sit at the head of the table, and Udo and Debbie, his daughter and, and son-in-law, and his wife would sit there. And in between were all of us from all over the world. And every night at supper, there would be a different crew of people coming in. And I remember one night when we were there, a fellow from India sat down. And he said, I am from, you know, the... Punjab region, blah, blah, all this. And he says, when I was a little boy, an American tourist, he said, as I was sitting on the street, wrapped up some food in a piece of paper and threw it to me. And he says, I took that, I opened it up, and I saved the paper, he said. And someone told me it was about some God that I had never heard of. And he said, when I got old enough to read, I read that paper, and it was a piece. What they had done is they'd torn up a, a Bible in the Indian language, the, the language of the people there, and, the, and he had put pieces of food in it, wrapped it up, and was just throwing out the word to people, this tourist was. And this man read that. He had one page of the Gospels. And he read that, and he started asking people. And he said, do you know where this came from? And they said, oh, it's obviously from Western Europe. That's where that religion is. And so he got to Western Europe, and he said, where did this come from? And they said, well, that's a book that people used to believe, but there's still some people in Switzerland that believe that. So he got to Switzerland, and he said, where did this come from? And they said, oh, there's a whole group of people in, up in uh, Villars, up, in, up there it's called Labrie. That's where they believe that. And he got to Francis Schaeffer's table with his little page. And he says, could you tell me about this? And they led him to Christ because... He wanted to seek the God that created this world. You see, Christ said, I'll light every man that comes into the world. You don't have to worry about everybody getting saved. You just have to worry about being faithful to who I give you to talk to. And I hope we are. Well, finally, our creator reveals that our only hope is found in Christ. Look at the rest of verse 4 of Psalm 19. It says their line has gone throughout the earth. That means that, that God has revealed the creature's need we are his creation. We have a need. And the whole earth tells us of that need. The whole earth groans with decay. But listen to this. This is where I want to focus this morning before we go. It says, in them, that's up in the sky, he, that's God, has placed a tent for the sun. Well, that's an interesting expression. In them, God set a little tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And verse 5 concludes, it rejoices as a strong man to run his race. Well, that's interesting. There are two metaphors here. The sun is described as being like a bridegroom, and the sun, I'm talking about the star that we're closest to, that yellow star that's a uh, middle-aged star. Uh, we'll talk about it in a minute. But, but that metaphor is that, that, that it's a runner and a, a bridegroom. I mean, a lot of people say that's a little bit out of place. But wait a minute. Isn't Jesus our bridegroom coming from heaven? Isn't he the one that says, look unto me, uh, I'm the author and finisher of your faith, run the race like I did? I mean, what a, this is an Old Testament allusion to Christ. 
He's our bridegroom. We're his bride. We're looking forward to being reunited with him at the wedding supper and being married to him forever. He is like a strong runner who has finished the race. He's already lived and experienced what we're going through, and he's in all points been tempted like as we are. What a beautiful picture. But the first point, and if you're a note taker, now we're in brand new material. Point number one, this text teaches Jesus is greater than the sun. The S-O-N is greater than the S-U-N. Now, have you thought about that much? I've been thinking about it so much this week that I went into the elders' meeting, and one of the men had a little piece of white fuzz on his shoulder. And I said to him, did you know that a piece of the sun the size of that fleck, and one of the elder, elders said, if it was in Oklahoma City, would kill us all. I said, you remember, I said that a year ago. I'm still thinking about the sun. Let me tell you about our sun. Our sun consumes every second it eats. 4.2 million tons of hydrogen. Big appetite. And it takes that hydrogen and through fusion, compressing it at thermonuclear temperatures, it compresses and fuses those atoms together, and helium is produced and light and an outburst of energy. Actually, 8.4 billion pounds of heat are produced by our sun every second. Heat can be measured in pounds. Let me tell you what one pound of heat can do, Okay. One pound of heat, one pound of matter that's converted to heat through what Einstein called e equals mc squared. What can it do? Well, its power is measured in megatons or millions of tons of explosive power. One pound of matter turned into pure heat can raise 20 million tons of rock that's just sitting there into incandescent boiling like water, red hot liquid. You know how much 20 million tons of rock is? Well, just I, we don't have any mountains around here, do we? Well, maybe in West Oklahoma. Just go out there and look at a good-sized mountain and just cut it out and take that thing and think of the energy it would take to melt and turn into bubbling, white-hot liquid, that rock. That's how much one pound of matter turned to heat can do. One pound. The sun produces 8.4 billion tons of heat. That's 2,000 times one pound every second. Do you know how much energy that is? Our sun in one second produces more energy than all the Earth's energy produced on this planet from creation till the end. It will never equal one second of the sun. And the Bible says Jesus is greater than the sun. Jesus is greater than the sun. Even though our sun is pumping out this energy, the, the heat you felt in July and August was only one half of one billionth of one percent of the sun's radiant heat, and, and it burns our skin. And Jesus is greater than that. In fact, when the Apostle John met Jesus, he said in Revelation 1.16, and when I saw him, his face was like the sun shining in its strength. How strong is it? Every second, it takes 4.2 million tons and converts it into 8.4 million tons of radiant heat. And one tiny pound of that could melt and bubble a mountain up to nothing but vapor, incandescent, gaseous rock. Jesus is greater than the sun. The sun is the most powerful thing we've ever experienced up close. The sun is the most powerful. I know that they know that there's more out there, but they've never examined one up close. And our sun is the most powerful force we know of in the universe up close. And Jesus said, I made it. I'm greater than that. Secondly, Jesus is as inescapable as our sun. Look at the next verse. Its rising is from one end of the heavens to the other. Its circuit is to the other end of them. And there's nothing hidden from its heat. And immediately the, the scientists say, ah, oh, ha, ha, look at the archaic nature. It sounds like the sun is revolving around the earth, and we know that the earth is, you know. And they go, oh, it's, it's so archaic. It doesn't know anything about science or anything. No, it's actually accurate. You say, what? Well, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Point number two is Jesus is as inescapable as the sun. This verse often is derided by skeptics as teaching that the, that the sun goes around the earth instead of the earth, which rotates on its axis and revolves around the sun. But what they don't tell you is that the sun is actually rotating too. And not only is it rotating, the sun is revolving in a gigantic course through our galaxy. And the whole time it's happening, our galaxy is on a a total revolution of its own around the cluster of galaxies. The entire universe is in motion. Listen to this. As far as scientists know, 
this writer of the 19th Psalm, inspired by God, was totally scientifically accurate, more so than his critics, because there is no fixed point of zero motion that has ever been found in our universe, as far as we know. You say, what do you mean by that? Let me ask you this. The next time you hear Carl Sagan, you know, talking about the cosmos out there, and he says, that star right there is 4.2 billion light years from us. From where? What's this the fixed point he's measuring from? What is the center of his universe that all of his astrophysical calculations are made from? The Earth. This is the only point we know. When, when, when they survey land, what do they look at? They get a fixed point on the planet. When they measure the distance from the Earth to the moon, how do they measure it? They say, this is the fixed reference point. What's the psalmist saying? He's saying this is the only fixed reference point we know. And the sun indeed is moving in a gigantic orbit through the Milky Way galaxy. And the psalmist uses the scientifically correct terminology of relative motion. Nobody knows where the fixed point of zero motion may be. So all reference points assume a fixed point. Navigators, astronomers, and every other scientist say the zero point is the Earth's surface at the point of the observer. So what did the psalmist say? Why, he was 4,000 years ahead of science. He said, this is the fixed point, our assumed fixed point, and the sun goes like a runner across the sky. Now, did God think that the sun revolved around the earth? No. God made it. God the sun. But he was speaking in human terms to tell us that there's no fixed point in the universe and that this is the place that God has fixed as our reference point. And the way he fixed it is he, the creator himself, came and walked on this planet. And he introduced himself to us. Now what's interesting, if you continue in verse 6, the most significant statement other than the astrophysical implications of zero motion points is it says the last part of verse 6, and this is all the further we'll go this morning for those of you that wonder where we're going. We're going to the end of verse 6. It says there's nothing hidden from its heat. Of course, this refers mainly, this little phrase, to the sun's effect on the earth. And scientists now know that the heat transmitted by the solar radiation empowers every activity on Earth, either directly or indirectly. Did you know we would cease to exist if the sun went out? Every bit of our winds and rains or the plant life through photosynthesis and thus all animals and human life rely on the sun. You say, oh, what about oil and that? Well, fossil fuels derived from buried organisms that drive our machinery are also products of the sun's effects. They're just vast forests that were around before Noah's flood that squashed them all, and that's where the coal came from. So all that derives back to the sun. Nothing on this planet that has anything to do with organic life cannot hearken back to the effects of the sun. It's significant that the science which deals with all these energy transfers is called thermodynamics. That, that's literally heat power. And basically, thermodynamics has two main laws. They're the best proved and the most universally applicable laws of science. I mean, if you go through school, at least learn those two, and you can impress people. Say, so, well, the first law of thermodynamics says that the, the universe is heading downward toward an eventual heat death, and the sun and our sun and all the other stars are going to burn out. That tells us, that's the second law, that there must have been a primeval creation, that the universe would already be dead if there hadn't been something that started all that. Because it can't self-start. Something had to start that, that heat energy, that explosion, the fusion. The only scientific conclusion is that in the beginning, God, a power greater than the universe, infused the universe with the spark and ignited those solar furnaces. But what's amazing is when this verse speaks about the sun going forth, it's not referring to it's just its trip across the sky. It's referring to its outgoing of radiant heat that we feel, that some people lay in, you know, it causes cancer, so they lay in it trying to get cancer, I guess. I'm not sure. But it's the same Hebrew word that's used in Deuteronomy 8.3. And I want to read that to you. In Deuteronomy 8.3, and that's what's so neat about Bible study, because God explains the book to us in other parts of the book. But it says in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3, He humbled you and he let you be hungry and he fed you with manna and you didn't know it and you, your fathers didn't know it. Why? That he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. There's the same word. It says the sun uh, 
proceeds out across the sky. That means that the radiant energy is proceeding out from the sun to us. What does that mean? I mean, big deal. So what? Well, the scriptures say this. The scriptures say that, that God said, just as you can't live without the radiant energy of the sun powering the solar heat that heats this planet, powering photosynthesis, causing the winds and the, the currents to proceed around this planet, you can't live physically, he said, without the S-U-N. So you cannot live spiritually without the S-O-N the Son of God. It's used in remarkable prophecy, this very same word of Christ coming in Bethlehem. It says in Micah 5 and verse 2 that the one coming, his goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. It says that Christ has eternally preceded. He has always come from the Father. Christ is eternally existing as the second person of the Trinity. Micah 5, 2 says, the Son is therefore a beautiful type of Christ. The Son pictures both the living Word and the written Word. He is the eternally begotten Son of God. He everlastingly proceeds from the Father, and the Father declares Him, John 1.18. And the Scriptures are forever settled in heaven, and they can continually sustain our spiritual lives, just like the Son sustains our physical lives. As marvelous as God's witness is from creation, though, it can't give you eternal life. And that's why I'd like you to turn with me from the Psalms to the special revelation of God to the book of Luke, chapter 11. And I'm going to conclude this morning by just taking you on a little journey to meet your creator. Some of you may have never met him. I mean, I never know. In a group this size, there might be someone like in the discovery class this morning that said that they went to church for about 40 years and they never had met their creator They knew all about him. They celebrated his birth. They celebrated his death. They celebrated his resurrection, but they never had met him. And what's wonderful is this morning you can meet your creator. If you just listen to his voice, here's what it says in Luke chapter 11, verse 17. Because Jesus speaks this morning to us through the scriptures. Are you listening? And the scriptures reveal that Jesus, our creator, because he's here this morning, can see some interesting things. What can he see? If you want to meet him this morning, what? How much of you can he see? Well, in Luke eleven seventeen, he can see your thoughts. For some of you, he can, in your thoughts, hear you doing this. When's this going to be over? You know, i got to go. Well, he, he can read your thoughts. Look at eleven seventeen. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, how would you like to have been walking on earth when Jesus was walking on earth? When Jesus was here on earth, he'd be standing there in his robe, you know, and, and you'd be sitting there thinking bad thoughts about him. And he would say, do you really think that about me? I have a big nose. <laughs> I, can, I can read your thoughts. And you go, you really can read my thoughts. And it says, he answered them. Isn't that amazing? He, knowing their thoughts, answered them. He answered the question they were thinking. Now, let me ask you this this morning. Does God like what you've been thinking this past week? Your thoughts about your husband, your wife, your parents, your employer, your children? Your supervisor, your teacher, I mean, does he like it? He knows your thoughts. And if you want his answer to your thoughts, it's right here. He wrote them down. Uh, turn to Luke 23, because in Luke 11, we see he knows our thoughts. But Luke 23, here's the creator walking on the earth. We want to meet him. He not only can see your thoughts and my thoughts, he can see your future. Your future. I mean, look at this. Here he's, he's hanging, dying for us, nailed to a cross, And he turns to the thief next to him and tells him his future. This is what it says. Jesus said to him, the dying thief, Truly I say unto you, there is the word amen, verily or amen, I say to you, today you're going to be with me in paradise. I'll tell you what, when Jesus Christ saves someone, there's no intermediate stops. You don't have to worry about some murky underworld place where you've got to go through the flames for a while and atone for all the bad stuff you did. If Jesus saves you, he pays the whole ticket. You don't, have, you don't go on the freight train and stop ten times on the way getting to heaven. The instant that you die, to be absent from the body is present with Christ. Jesus turned to the thief on the cross and said, Your sins, though they're many, your guilt, though great, has been all taken away because of your Trust in me as your sacrifice. That's what he said on the cross. He knew this fellow's future. And he assured him that he was going to be with Jesus in paradise. Now, if anyone teaches you that there's anything between here and heaven, they're not teaching the Bible. 
There is nothing between here and heaven for a believer except the fabrications of untruthfulness of some beliefs, of some false teachings. Jesus said for a believer to be absent from this body is to be present with him. But not only does he know their future, look at John 4. That's the next book. I did this in order, so if some of you don't know the Bible very well, you can find it. After chapter 23 and 24 starts John. Look at John 4. Jesus, here this morning, what can he see? He can see your thoughts, Luke 11. He can see your future, Luke 23. John 4, 17, dun, 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 he can see your past. Now, that's a part of our lives a lot of us just wish wasn't around. I mean, got some bad stuff back there? Wish nobody would find out about it? Well, look what happens in John 4. The woman answered and said, I don't have a husband. This is the woman at the well. And Jesus said to her, that's true. You're talking truth there. Verse 18, you have five husbands. And the guy you're living with now you're not even married to. She just goes, ah, how'd you know that? You know what her immediate response was? She said, I know who you are. You're the Messiah. Because only God knows our past intricately, intimately. Only God knows our thoughts. Only God knows our future. If you met Jesus this morning, secondly, not only what does he know, but secondly, what, what can he do if you met him this morning? You don't have to turn there because you get lost. Let me just read to you what others did when they met Jesus. Number one, in Mark 5, 7, when demons faced him, they were terrified. Now, demons, I mean, you know, everyone's reading about these rocks and is there life on Mars? Of course there's life on Mars. There's life all throughout the universe. God's already told us that. It's not human life, and it's not people that are going to get saved, and they're not aliens that are going to come and impart something to us. There are demons. The word daimonia means intelligence. There are highly intelligent supernatural creatures that live all over this universe, and in the tribulation, God's going to collect them all and dump them here on the planet, and they can't get out, and they're going to raise a terrible ruckus. I'm glad Christians don't have to be here during that time. But when those demons came face to face with Christ, they were scared stiff. They cried with loud voices, Mark 5, 7. They says, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Did you know that demons and Satan don't have any trouble with their theology? They know who he is. There would not be one Jehovah's Witness demon in the world. There would not be any Moonies or Mormon demons. They're all believers. They just have never been converted. Their hearts never been changed, but they know the truth. They know who he is. They don't say, You're an angel like we are. They say, you are the Holy One of the Most High God. Don't torment us. They know he's the judge. When Jesus faced his creation in Mark 11, 20, a tree, and he rebuked the tree, it says in Mark 11, 20, in the morning when they passed by, they saw the tree dried up from the roots, and Peter remembered what he said, and he said, Master, The fig tree you cursed withered away. When a tree faced its maker, it withered before him. That tree knew who made it. Those demons know the creator. When disease met Christ, disease fled away. In Luke 4.39, it says Jesus stood over Peter's mother-in-law. By the way, if Peter had a mother-in-law, he had a wife. That means he was married. But I won't even talk about that. But but Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And he stood over and rebuked the fever, and immediately she rose and ministered unto them. The fever fled from Christ, the disease. When demons met him, they were scared to death. When trees met him, they just wilted in front of him. When fever and disease, they ran away. When the winds and waves of a fierce storm faced Christ, it says in Luke 8, 24, they fell silent. Luke writes this, and they came to him and awoke him and said, Master, we perish. And he arose, he rebuked the wind, and the raging of the water, they ceased, and there was immediate calm. Have you ever met your creator? What are you going to do when you meet him? If you don't meet him now, you're going to wither like that tree. You're going to be terrified as the demons because you're going to go to the same place as the demons are going with Satan. Will you hear his voice this morning? I'd like to take three extra minutes and read to you something from the newspaper I guess this most clearly, graphically tells me what it's like to not listen. Now, this is a funny story, but it's very sobering. When Mount St. Helens belched gray steam plumes hundreds of feet into the blue Washington sky, geologists watched their seismographs with growing wonder as the earth danced beneath their feet. 
Rangers and state police with sirens blaring herded the tourists and residents from an ever-widening zone of danger. Every piece of scientific evidence being collected in the laboratories and on the field predicted that Mount St. Helens would soon explode with a fury that would flatten the forest. Warning, blared loudspeakers from patrol cars and helicopters hovering overhead. Warning, blared the police in their patrol cars from megaphones. Warning, pleaded radio and television announcers and shortwave and citizen band operators. Warning, echoed up and down the mountains and through the lakeside villages and tourist camps along the hiking trails as they were emptied with people who heard the warnings fled for their lives. But Harry Truman refused to budge. Harry was a caretaker for the Recreation Lodge on Spirit Lake, a mere five miles north of Mount St. Helens. The lake reflected the smoke and shrouded peak, and he kind of liked the view. The rangers warned Harry of the coming blast. The neighbors begged him to join them as they left in their exodus of fear. Even Harry's sister called to talk to the old, some sense into the old man's head. Harry ignored the warnings. From his picture postcard beauty of his lakeside home, reflecting the snow-capped peak overhead, Harry grinned on national television and said, Nobody knows more about this mountain than old Harry. It won't explode on me. On May 18, 1980, as the boiling gases beneath the mountain's surface began to bulge and buckle the landscape, and as the landscape was stretched to its final limits, Harry was frying some eggs and a little bacon. After breakfast, he fed his 16 cats the scraps from his table, and he knelt to plant petunias around the border of his freshly mowed, beautiful green lawn. At 8.31 a.m., the mountain exploded. Did Harry regret his decision in that millisecond he had before the concussive waves, traveling faster than the speed of sound, flattened him and everything else for 150 miles to the ground? Did he have time to mourn his stubbornness as millions of tons of rock disintegrated and disappeared into a cloud reaching 10 miles into the sky? Did Harry struggle against the wall of mud and ash that was 50 feet high, superheated, that buried his cabin, his cats? his freshly mowed lawn and the petunias? Or was Harry vaporized like 100,000 people in the Japanese city of Hiroshima when Mount St. Helens erupted with a force 500 times greater than the nuclear bomb which leveled that city? Now Harry is a legend in the corner of Washington where he refused to listen. His face still smiles down on us from posters and T-shirts and beer mugs. Balladeers sing of a song about old Harry, the stubborn man who put his ear to the mountain but wouldn't heed the warnings. Let me read to you some more somber warnings than Harry refused to hear. Because if you don't listen to Christ now, you will later. He said in John chapter 5, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves will hear my voice. And they will come forth... They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and those that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And it shall be at the end of the world that the angels will come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus warns, meet me as creator, find me as your redeemer, or face me as your judge. You won't be able to stand in the judgment without me, he says. Father, I pray that this morning that we wouldn't have any hard-hearted Harry Trumans that refuse to hear the warning from the very lips of the Creator as he says, marvel not, the hour is coming when even those in the grave will hear my voice. And those that have trusted me to the resurrection of the righteous and those that have put it off and neglected and turned their hearts away from me to suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. You are the creator. You are the redeemer. You're the judge. I pray that your spirit would draw to yourself all those whom you are convicting, and shining your light upon their hearts today, that before 
they leave today, they might come and meet their creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died to wash away our sins with his own blood. We pray you do a great work for Christ's sake. Amen.